Well, hello everyone, Pastor McConnell here. Tonight is Wednesday night, just in case you didn't know that today is Wednesday and it's Wednesday evening. A minute or two before we jump into our Know Your Bible session. Hey, Stephanie, good evening. Hello, hello. Um, so we're going to be jumping in here in a minute or two. Hey, Tony. And uh, invite you to grab a Bible. The whole idea here is to grow in the knowledge of our Bible, in, in the facility of our Bible, knowing what it is, what it says, and uh, just making it our own, right? Making it our own. Uh, it's because it's 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 God's words to us, and so it's great if we understand and can apprehend, comprehend, apprehend, apply God's truth. So I invite you to uh, go ahead and do that. Um, and we're gonna pray here. Let's see what time we have. I always like to try, try to start right on time. So we have, you know, maybe thirty or forty seconds. Hope your week is going well. 2021. Here we are, February. Right? It's just speeding along. I guess the um, the uh, groundhog saw a shadow yesterday. I honestly I didn't I didn't see what the answer was, but I did hear that we have six more weeks of winter. <laughs> Which some of us are like, yes, and others are like, no. <laughs> Anywho, so we're going to be uh, jumping in here right now. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for these moments together and are grateful for um, the opportunity to look into your word, God. And, and so we're asking you, Holy Spirit, to be our teacher, to be our guide, to lead us, to guide us in all that we do and all that we you know, say, even as we read, God, let our eyes and ears and hearts and ultimately our lives be open to the impact and the interweaving of the Word of God, the Word of Truth with our lives, God. We just open ourselves to that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. And I remind you of Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 23. My son, my daughter, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Hey, Wendy, thanks for joining. So we are in Galatians chapter 3. We've been talking about uh, the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 1 and chapter 2. And it's evident right from the beginning that the apostle Paul is writing to these ones that he loves and knows and he is pinpointing a specific issue that has come up. We, we read at the end of, uh, of chapter 2, remember these words, verse 21? The Apostle Paul saying, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Remember him saying that? As and earlier in chapter 2, he said there were... Some, some among the brethren, some among the congregation that were raising up uh, doubts and bringing um, despair and, and thoughts over the freedom that, we, that exists in Christ Jesus. And the Apostle Paul says in no uncertain words, he says, we did not pay attention, receive what they had to say for a minute. And you know, that, that, and, and for what purpose? So that the gospel, the good news about Jesus, might be preserved for all the generations, including this one that you and I are living in. So thank God for faithful people who know the truth, receive the truth, and, and plant their roots in it. That's why we're doing this, this teaching, by the way. It's so that we not just increase our knowledge, but it's so that we hear and receive the truth and plant our lives in it, not just for our generation, but for the generations to come. All right? Here's chapter 3, verse 1. It says, you foolish Galatians. Because, you know, Paul likes to tiptoe into things, right? <laughs> he likes to be like gentle. No, he just goes right for it. You foolish Galatians. And when we understand... 
the because he, he's been intimating this as we're coming into chapter three. So this is not all of a sudden. When you understand what's at stake and what the exchange is that's taking place, yes, it is foolish. It is foolish. We'll get into that more. So you foolish Galatians, who has hypnotized you, he asks, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was vividly portrayed as crucified. So two things are happening here. He asks the question, who has hypnotized you? Uh, literally, he's asking, who has bewitched you? And that word, baskeno, has the, 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 it has the underpinning, the underpinning that what they are being, this, this teaching that is in there, that Jesus Christ is not enough. His crucifixion, his uh, burial, death, resurrection is not enough. We need something plus Jesus. That teaching, he's pointing out, when he asks the question, who has bewitched you? What he is strongly intimating is that the origination of such a teaching, the Jesus plus something, is necessary to be the, the, the salvation message. That The origination of that is from hell itself. It's from hell itself. It's not just, not just a human thought though it's being communicated through humans, but the origination, it's from hell itself. Because when we understand what the gospel is and what the reality of the gospel is, we understand, oh, we, this is what's at stake. And that's why he leads off this, this chapter with, you foolish Galatians. It fits. Be because he, he contrasts the bewitching with the reality of, of Jesus Christ crucified, which is a vivid portrayal, right? It's a vivid telling. In fact, um, that that portrayal has to do. Um, I, I believe I believe the, the word is pro prography, and we get the pro there. You know, we get for or to um, or unto or, or on behalf of, right? But the graphy is the word we, we, that, that the Greek word that we translate scripture, what's written. And so what, it's, what he is saying is that over and over and over again, the reality of the gospel has been written into the record of God's revelation to his people. We're going to get into that. He's going to get into that, um, that where it over and over again, that's why it's such a vivid portrayal and why he's saying, okay, you have to have a bewitching take place to have you begin to embrace this Jesus plus doctrine. Jesus is enough, my friends. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Verse 2, I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? So he's about to hit them up with some rhetorical questions. You know some rhetorical questions? You know, like when parents, I remember my mom would ask me, like, did you go bad when you made this decision? She would ask me that. And I looked real quick. I was not supposed to answer that question. Okay? I was not supposed to say, no, mom, I didn't go bad when I did that. No. She, that was a rhetorical question where the answer is already, it's asked and answered in the, in the question. All right? So the Apostle Paul says, I only want to learn this from you, but I already know the answer. So don't even answer. Okay? Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And the answer is, yes, hearing with faith. That's where we receive the Spirit. Are you so foolish? Man, he's really caught up on this. He's like, okay, listen, this is not a light matter. This is not a, hey, well, you know, if you, you know, if we can come or go, it can be a little, a little. No, it's like serious, critical, core. This is a core issue. Are you so foolish? After beginning with the spirit, are you now going to be made complete by the flesh? You know, when we understand the reality of the flesh and what we reap when we sow to the flesh. He's going to, um, in, in Galatians, later on, Galatians chapter 5, he'll really explore that. 
But when, when we understand the reality and how different the, the, the dichotomy between the spirit, the capital S spirit, and the flesh, they are so intrinsically opposite. So when the Apostle Paul says, what are you thinking? Okay, so you began this whole thing in the power of the Spirit of God. Because the reality of our circumstance, the human condition is, we can't do it. Right? We've established that when we looked at the book of Romans. We established that even in this uh, chapter already. And we'll talk about, he, he, you know, because we talked about this already. The Apostle Paul is the gospel. You might as well call him Apostle Gospel Paul. That's his middle name. You know, maybe it's Gospel, 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 a.k.a. call me Paul. Because he is so about the gospel and the integrity of it. Thank God for that. Right? Okay. So, when you understand the reality of the gospel, there is no way for you to exchange. Okay, so somehow... I am now going to complete myself. I mean, I wasn't able to do it before, but now I can. No. No, that, that will never be a reality. It will never be a reality. We will always, as we live in these bodies here on earth, we will always be in that place of utter and complete dependence on the Spirit of God. And that is great news. That is great news. You see, this is why the, these, these followers, whoever that was that was going, were going down this track, were so foolish because they were, they were not seeing what, what they were being led into. They were being led back into the reality of like, well, it depends on you. It's up to you. You better do your best. You better do your best. Even though your best is less than 100%, maybe way, way less than 100%, and that's the standard. It's perfection. Does anybody have perfection? I don't. Do you have perfection? So we will always, in the gospel, be in utter dependence on God. And that is good news, my friends. This is why the Apostle Paul is saying, Galatians, are, are you foolish? Why would you exchange? Okay, continue on. Verse 4. Did you suffer so much for nothing, if in fact it was for nothing? Okay, so apparently they, there was some, they paid the price, you know. Um, you, you know, there was some sort of persecution, and, and that totally makes sense, given the, 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 the current um, status of things, okay, right? Whether it was from... Um, you know, if you might devout or, you know, pharisaical Jews or from the Roman government, you know, they, there was a price to pay for following Jesus. So Galatians, not probably unlike other communities of faith, other cities in where the church existed, man, they were facing some pressure, some, some you know, uh, probably death, threats, beatings, etc. All the things that, you know, we read about in the, in the Apostle Paul's life that was probably common in all of these communities. So there was a price that had been paid for the, the purity and the beauty and the, the, just the wonderfulness of the gospel. And so the Apostle Paul is like, did you suffer for nothing? So verse 5, so then... Does God, he's just still hitting them up with the rhetorical questions, right? So then, does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Yeah, so he's saying, yeah. D does God, is God um, now looking at, okay, how do you measure up? Okay, all right, you measure up, good. Okay, I'm working miracles among you. Or is it because you have believed in Jesus. That's what that hearing of faith means. Remember the Bible says, uh, faith comes by hearing. Hey Dave, good evening. Thanks for joining us. So, um, the Bible says in, in Romans, right? Romans chapter 9, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, this faith, when he says hearing with faith, that just means, that's aka 
believe in Jesus. So is God, is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit among you, is he working miracles? Is he un unleashing himself fully because you fully obeyed the law or is it because you trusted in Jesus? Which is it of that, right? And he's clear, it's option B. Yes, because you trusted in Jesus. Verse 6, just as Abraham believed God, and it was credit. Now, we, we, so we've left the rhetorical questions, and now we're, we're doing some, some history. He's just reminding them of the historical context into which they have been born into the body of Christ. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. So listen, if you've been with us when we were studying the book of uh, Romans, these words should sound very, very familiar. Let me read uh, just Romans 6 right quick. Romans 6, here we go, here we go. Um, yes, so let's see, therefore, what then? Oh, I'm sorry, Romans, it's actually Romans 4, Romans 4. Uh, 413, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would inherit the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness that comes by what? Faith, believing, right? Verse 14, this is Romans 4 now. If those who are of the law are heirs, okay, so if, if, we, could, if, we, could, um, if we could receive that by the law, right? That's what he's saying here. Faith is made empty and the promise is canceled. For the law produces wrath. Why does the law produce wrath? Because we fail to meet it. Right? And earlier in Romans chapter 3, we see that the wages of sin is death. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why the promise is by faith. So that it may be according to grace to guarantee it to all the descendants. And who are the descendants? Not only those to those who are of the law, that's of the Jewish lineage, but also to those who are of Abraham's faith. That's everybody else. That's you and I when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul is like, why would you ever give that up, Galatians? Just as Abraham believed, so we're back in Galatians 3, verse 6 now, and it was credit to him for righteousness, then understand that those who have faith are Abraham's sons. We just read that in Romans chapter 4, verse 8. Now the scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and told the good news ahead of time to Abraham. So all the way, this is what we're seeing when we were looking back at um, Jesus Christ who was vividly portrayed. And I remember I said that's prography, prography. That is uh, referring to what was written, okay? Um, and we have all the way back to that conversation that Abraham and God have in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12 where God says to Abraham, hey, all the nations, all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. And this is the, the, the epoch of it. This is the, the um, confirmation of that, of that truth, the unfolding of it. Verse 9, so those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. Right? Okay, so he's just reminding, remember this is just, reminding the Galatians and by the Holy Spirit, reminding you and I, hey, listen, you are with Abraham because Abraham was um, that covenant that he and God ratified was meant to enfold all who would believe. So he's going to continue with that. Verse 10, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse because it is written, Everyone who does not continue doing everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Hey, listen. So, hey, Shari. So, this is the point, right? That if you, hey, listen, if you, if you want to live by the law, okay, by the standards of, hey, I'm a good person. I, I do this. I do that. I've done this. Okay, all right. Well, you need to judge. Then you're going to be judged according to the law. Okay, according to your works. 
And as we have already reiterated again and again, that needs to be 100% because with God, because God is perfect. And so he's saying, okay, you want to live by the law. All right, you need to do, you need to do, this is from Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26, by the way. Everyone who does not continue doing everything, everything written in the law, in the book of the law, is cursed. Verse 11. Now, it is clear that no one, it is clear, it is clear, Galatians, it is clear, what's clear? That no one is justified before God by the law. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> Paul gives like a, a possible scenario where someone could be like, you know what, I think I'm going to find a way to be justified before God by the works and the things that I do and don't do. And he said, listen, that's not possible. It's not possible. Verse 12, but the law, I'm sorry, verse 11, now it is clear no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. Literally, the righteous by faith will live. The righteous who are made righteous by faith, by faith, by believing in Jesus. You want to be right with God? Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. If you want to be right with God, it's not about what you've done, what you didn't do, what you did. And it believe, trust, put your trust in Jesus. Receive him as the Savior, the leader, the Lord of your life. Okay? Verse 13. I'm sorry, verse 12. But the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will live by them. Right? Do you see that? Okay, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us. This is why we believe in him. This is why we're joining uh, with him. He has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. We'll look at this when we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written, everyone who is hung on a tree is cursed. This is Deuteronomy 21 verse 23. Verse 14 the purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles by Christ Jesus because they would have faith in him so that we could receive the promised Holy Spirit, Spirit through faith or, or literally the Spirit of promise through faith. Verse 15, brothers and sisters, I'm using a human illustration. So he's about to use a human illustration. No one sets aside or makes additions to even a human covenant that has been ratified. Okay, you make a covenant, an agreement with someone humanly speaking, you know, you, you don't get to like come after the fact and be like, well, eh, I rethink, I rethought, mm. no, it, because it's now law, right? Now, verse 16, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Okay, so pay attention to the flow of, of, of what Paul is about to say here. It can get a little... So just pay attention right quick. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Okay? He does not say and to seeds. So he's about to make, he's about to link Abraham, Abraham to a seed. And we, we were about to find out who is the seed? Who is the seed? So let that question kind of stay there in your mind. Who is the seed? Because he does not say and to seeds. Because he's saying that that is also saying something. It's not to seeds, not to multiple seeds, which is... Uh, which is you and I, the generations, the people. It's not to them. So who is it for? Right? Uh, he doesn't say and to seeds, as though referring to many, but referring to one. And to your seed. Who is? Who is that? Christ. Okay? Verse 17. And I say this. The law. Listen to this. This is so good. The law, which came 430 years Later, this is after Genesis uh, 15, 12, 12 is where, um, if you might, Abraham is first introduced, Abram is first introduced to God, and verse uh, chapter 15 is where that covenant is ratified. So the law which came, so 430 years after that is when the law came, just FYI, that's a good thing to know, does, it does not, so the law that came later does not revoke a covenant that was previously ratified by God and cancel the promise. 
But Paul is going thick. He, so remember, what is he addressing with the Galatians? Galatians, you are making an exchange that is foolish. Let me tell you all of the background to where, how we got where we are right now with this precious gospel. Let me tell you about it. It's like someone, you know, when, when, you, when you're holding something valuable, but you don't know it's valuable, and so you need someone to tell you, do you know how that thing came about? Let me tell you why that's so valuable. Let me tell you about how it even came about. Right, okay. So, verse 18, For if the inheritance is from the law, it is no longer from the promise. Right? Because the promise preceded the law. The law was had it afterward. We'll talk about that. But God granted it to Abraham through the promise. Okay, so my Bible here says, um, in, in the, it, it labels this sec next section, the purpose of the law, as we kind of round off to the end here. Verse 19, so why then was the law given? After the promise, by the way, right? It was added because of transgressions until the seed, remember who's that? Who's that? The seed is Jesus, right? To whom the promise was made would come. Okay? So, listen, when you read the Old Testament, and you read all the way back in Genesis, right? Even, um, even starting, you know, you start with the creation account, and then you have the, the temptation with Eve and Adam, and, and the serpent, and the devil and, and the, the fall and failure of mankind and the separation. And even in Genesis chapter 3, when God, um, you know, provides coverings for uh, Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness, even there he's embedding the idea of the, this covering, this, this, that God, this sacrifice that would be there for, uh, that would make it possible for mankind all people, I say mankind, all people, men, women, boys, girls, everyone, to be restored back to God in fellowship. How would that happen? It would happen by a sacrifice. And all of that, so when, you, when, you, when we read in the Old Testament of all the sacrificial systems as the law comes into, it's all of it is picturing the seed, the coming of the seed, who is Jesus, the fulfilling of the promise, the covenant that was ratified there in Genesis chapter 15 from Abraham. Right? Okay, so we just need to keep that in our, in our minds and hearts. And this is why, the, so just to reiterate, this is why the Apostle Paul is talking to the Galatians about the, 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 just the value of it. He wants them to understand all Galatians, all state collegians, all Santa County ones, all uh, nations of the earth, all United States Christians, all European Christians, all of y'all understand the value of the gospel, the, the reality, the beauty of it, and don't exchange it for a minute. Don't exchange it for a minute. Don't give up on it. Don't understand its value. That's what he's saying. The law, it was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. That's Jesus. The law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. What is that? The law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. Remember, how did the law come to be? It was given through Moses, right? And how, how did he receive that? It was in the presence of God. And apparently there was angelic handing off, right, involved. And this mediator, that's Moses. It, it was it, The law was given to the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, through Moses. Okay, verse 20. Just more history now, just more. Just you know, Now you're seeing the facet, all the facets, like a diamond. You're looking at it and you're like, oh, wow, over here it's brilliant. Over there it's brilliant. Over there it's brilliant. Wow, oh, it's just all brilliant all the way around. Verse 20. Now a mediator is, mediator is not, not for just one person, but God is one. Is the law therefore contrary? This is an important question. Is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? Absolutely not. All right? Because what? It originated from God. Both things originated from God. Anything that originates from God is good. Okay? Anything that originates from Him is good. See the creation. 
For if a law had been given that was able to give life, this is so good right here. For if a law had been given that was able to give life, then righteousness would certainly be by the law. Okay, so the law is good, but it has limitations as it pertains to producing righteousness in us. In fact, it, at what we read in the, in the New Testament is that the law it, it, it like concentrates the transgressions, right? It's like the standard is raised, and what do we do? It's not, it doesn't produce righteousness. What it produces is increased transgression, increased wrong. Verse 22, but the scripture has imprisoned everything under sin's power. In other words, hey, the, the standard of truth, the standard of the law the law, a.k.a. the scripture, that the standard holds us as we stand up before God. It holds us in, in prison because it says, you've broken me. Again and again and again. Here's the standard, the truth, the law, etc. And you have broken me. So in that sense, we are in this prison. Everything under sin's power so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who who believe. You know, so here we are in this prison of our own making, right? And we can't get out. We're, we're saying, oh, let me do this. Oh, let me make this resolution. Okay, if I just do that, then I'll be, if I, if I just do this, okay, if I do that, okay, and, and, and it's like someone just trying to break out, you know, and, and they just can't. And then someone says, here's the key, believe in Jesus. Boom, we're out of prison. Okay, verse 23, before this faith came, just reiterating it again, before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. Like 23 and 22 are just the restating of each other. 24, the law then was our guardian. Okay, this imprisonment, it was our guardian. In other words, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I, I've never been in a prison, like, um, but I've, I've talked to my fair share of those that have. And so many, it, it's such a reality check. It is such a reality check. You know, whatever I've been doing, you know, da, 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 I, did, I did this or whatever it is. And, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I'm, I'm getting away with it, man. I'm just doing my thing. I'm just flying high, doing my thing. Oh, this is awesome. And then I land in prison and it's like, oh, wait, this is where I am? Really? This is my reality? And that's the reality of the law. That's the purpose of the law. In that sense, it's our guardian. The Greek word comes from this, the word we get pedagogy, right? It, it, it's, it's our tutor. And you think to yourself, well, it's our tutor. What is it teaching us? Yeah, it's teaching us the most important thing we need to know that in order to be restored to be reconnected to God. Well, first of all, we are disconnected from God, right? By, by virtue of our sin. Okay, that's one. Reality number one. Two, in order to be reconnected to God, that it is not going to be on the basis of what we can or can't do. Right? Because we've established, I'm in prison, and I have made choices to get me here. Right? And so the proof is in the pudding of what I can do. What I must do is believe in the action of another, Jesus Christ, who suffered, was crucified, was buried, and rose again. The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith, is what we're saying. Verse 25 just to, as we, as we round off to the end here. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Verse 26, For you are all sons of God, daughters of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. See the Apostle Paul, he's taking them on a little bit of a journey. He said, okay, hey Galatians, uh, what are you doing? Understand what this precious gospel is. Let me take you on a journey. 
And then at the end, he declares to them, hey, it's not Jesus plus something. Nope. No, 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 no. It's not Jesus plus something is going to make me right before God. No, nope. it's Jesus. And by faith in Christ Jesus, you are all sons and daughters of God. Sons and daughters of God. That is how we are reconciled into relationship and fellowship with God. And listen, you know, one of the things um, that the Lord has just really been uh, talking to me about, sharing with me, just reminding me about over the, over the last years, and it, is that this is not just good news to those who are currently outside of Christ. I mean, we're reading about the Galatians. They are, this, these are people, he's writing to people that are in Christ, right? So it should tell us, this is not just good news to people who are outside of Christ. It is good news to the Christians because like the Galatians, you know, whatever, you know, this uh, some self-improvement part of us or something wants to grab the reins of our life. You know, it grab, you know, I, okay, I got into the room via faith, right? I'm in the room. Now, God, I, I can handle it. I, I, I can take it from here now, God. I, 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 can, I, can, I can do it. And that is not true. It, it, is, it is, not only is it not true, but it is bondage. It is bondage. Fellow Christian, it is bondage. Our life, the life that we live, is meant to be lived by grace through faith. The life, of the daily life that we're living is meant to be lived by grace through faith. The same way we enter into the family of God. By grace through faith. It's not going to be something else. Right? So even, you know, the, the reality of sanctification and growing in Christ. And yes, there are habits, you know, reading the Bible, praying and worship and fellowship and all of those things are, are part of the dynamic. But don't let those things be, you know, some become some kind of like, okay, now, now I got it, God. No, no. I mean, I didn't have it before, but now, now I have it. No, 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 no. Now, God, you have me. And flowing out of you have me, I worship and I fellowship and I read the Bible and I apply the Bible's truths to my life and I, I lean into the Holy Spirit and I seek His fruit and His graces, His ministry through my life, right? Yeah, so let's not get that twisted like the Galatians were getting it. All right, that's the whole Holy Spirit uh, challenge and opportunity to us through these words. All right, on that note, we're going to pause for the night. We're going to be jumping into Galatians 4 next week, Lord willing. And uh, so at this time, let's pray. Father God, oh, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the gospel. Oh God, I'm just, I, I just speak for myself and I speak for my friends, God. The liberty, the embrace, the, the grace Oh God, thank you for the gospel. Where would I be without the gospel? I know where I'd be. I'd be on this, under, under the wide road, the Bible says. The wide road that leads to a godless eternity. I, I'd be living a godless life here on earth, leading to a godless eternity. That's where I'd be without the reality of the gospel. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your grace, for your love, God, that you didn't leave us, didn't leave me, didn't leave my friends to the machinations of ourselves. Oh, God. Because we have seen, we have seen, if we've lived for any length of time, we've seen where those things take us. We've seen, oh, God, and they, 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 they end with corruption and hurt and self-sabotage and just... You know, crash and burns. We've seen it. We've seen it. Had a belly full of that, God. And we are so thankful for the reality of the gospel. Lord, we want to plant our roots in that reality. That you so loved the world that you gave your one and only son, Jesus. That we should not perish but have eternal and everlasting life. 
thank you, God. We bless your name. Amen. All right. Well, hey, listen, thanks so much for joining with me uh, tonight. And whether you're here again live tonight or um, you'll see this later on or, you know, dipped in and dipped out, um, just bless you, bless you, bless you. Let's plant our roots deep in the gospel. See you later.